I want to start in verse 12 and read through verse 7 of chapter 2. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted in ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of our God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth and I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. There's a lot there, but I wanted it in our hearts and our ears. And I will say this as I say every week. There's several disciplines that, without which we will not have joy. And one of those is that if we are not in the Word of God, we will be carried along by every thought, emotion, problem, concern, and you name it. If we're not listening to the scripture, if we're not seeing it in its pages, we are not listening for what God is teaching. And then the second thing is to be in fellowship with his people. If we are not in the assembly, we are forsaking the promises of God. For the means of grace through the local assembly of the saints is where we are instructed to do the work of the ministry. It is where we are equipped to overcome the world. It is where we are reminded of the promises of God on which we stand. And the list goes on and on. And to forsake it, to forsake it, is to not receive the fullness of what God has promised. Now see, when I say those things, a lot of people who are academically gospel-minded they don't like it because they automatically think, well, now you're telling me some things I'm, I have to do as a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that what Paul's writing to Timothy? Things that Timothy must do as a pastor? Isn't that what Paul writes to the Romans? Things that they must know and then also that they must be doing as believers in Rome? The whole of the New Testament, all the letters are teaching us what we must be doing as well as what we must know and how we must learn. And so for anyone to make the claim that there's nothing to do in the context of the New Testament hasn't read it. And I would surmise that even they would possibly not understand the Bible at all, not understand the totality of Scripture. And the charge of legalists could come, and in the same breath, maybe on the other side of the coin, the charge of antinomian comes. That means people would say, we don't have to. You're saying there is nothing to obey. There is nothing to do. Beloved, Timothy is written received this letter as an instruction from Paul in order that he might instruct the church how they ought to live an orderly life. You see. The only time that that's inappropriate is when the preacher, and more importantly the shepherd, the pastor, begins to press the church in such a way as to apply guilt upon their lives and worse, fear upon their eternal life if they're not meeting the conditions of these well and ordered commands. 
that would be in, that would be inappropriate. Paul assumes something with every letter that he writes. And he assumes divinely that every person receiving that letter is a child of God, regenerated, born of the Spirit, receiving the gospel like a child. And yes, even children can believe the gospel before they are taught all the theology therein. God, in His Word, teaches the full counsel of Himself, which includes not only the truth about who He is, but also, as Brother Mike taught yesterday at our men's meeting, the truth of what He's done and how we are a participant in His work. And then He teaches us how we ought to walk, what we ought to think. I mean, think of the commands of Paul and all through these letters to Timothy. Timothy, as an elder of the church, many will depart from the faith. Many will go on and do their own thing. They won't listen to the fact that Matthew 18, our Lord and Savior, has taught us how we handle conflict, division, sin. They won't listen to the fact that I've told them not to do this, that, or the other. And if they do, they are not to be considered brothers until they straighten out. See, this is not an issue of who's reprobate or who's apostate or who's born again and who's not. The only testimony that we judge that by is the testimony of grace. Is my righteousness Christ imputed to me? Is Christ's death justice for my sins? Uh, am I trusting in Christ? Work. That's what faith points to, right? You've heard me say many times people have faith in their faith. I said, well, I'm, my believing has saved me. No, Christ has saved you. You believe Christ has saved you. It sounds very, you know, I don't know, insignificant, but I would say that it's very significant. Because even as born-again believers, even as children of God, even of those who are saved by the power of God, by grace, through faith, we can easily fall prey to starting to, what? Listen to the instructions. And then we'll start walking a little bit in our own way of going, you know what? I don't curse and smoke and drink or date women who do. You know, that old joke. I don't do this and I don't do that and I'm not like them and I'm not like them. And that is the example that Jesus gave of a condemned person, a person who's not justified, a person who is not crying out and by faith holding fast to the mercies of God who became our propitiation, so on and so forth. So I say all that as a way of reminder, beloved, because we're about to get into some instruction. The instruction is ours to receive and ours to apply and ours to be accountable to. And if we reject that, we can't play together. We can't live together. We cannot disobey Christ and say we love him. We cannot subject our enemies or our brothers and sisters to our own judgment and say we love Christ. And I've said this probably at least once a month. Since 2007. Because that's the furthest back that I remember me saying this. Publicly. People love to hear preaching. But they do not want to be pastored. And when that makes someone angry. So be it. Beloved we love one another. Paul loved Timothy with a love that we cannot understand. Paul has told Timothy that there were some teachers of which he only named two, and those were the two that Paul had already excommunicated. You understand that the naming only happens after the discipline has been executed. And what was Paul's desire? That these two men would apologize and cease this foolishness and come back in and mercifully be received, forgiven as they were before they started it. There's no more conditions in forgiveness except that we forgive. 
So Paul is saying that because of these two men and what they've done, they've caused a chain reaction in the church, and a lot of people now are at odds with the teaching, uh, you know how it is. Well, I'm not so sure I believe that interpretation. Paul never had to have interpretation of his letters. They speak for themselves. I command you to do this. This ought not be so. This is what grace is. Faith does this. It's just simple. I mean, do we have to sit out, uh, for those of you who know what Betty Crocker is, do we have to sit out with a Betty Crocker cookbook and, 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 and look and wonder what it means to stir? Did she really mean stir or did she mean think about it in our heads? Or call somebody and stir them up about Betty's book? No, spoon in. Here we go. We don't have to overanalyze everything as if we're some kind of got some kind of Gnostic spark or, or psychic connection with, with, with this divine power somewhere that's given us knowledge that nobody else has. That's not how it works. The academics of the world can understand and even apply and do and mimic the realities of the instructions to the church, but they cannot mimic resting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that when they continue to hold fast to what they think they know and what they think they do that satisfies God. The only thing that satisfies God the Father in righteousness is the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's it. And in the weeks to come, we're going to, start, we're going to talk about some of these theological things at length. But as we... Look here, we need to be reminded that what Paul is saying now, starting in verse 18, he's, he's reminded Timothy of this great gospel. He's reminded Timothy of the power of Christ. He's reminded Timothy that he, as an apostle, was not something he sought after, but God appointed him. And then he's telling Timothy, as you go over to 2 Timothy and you start looking, you see there were prophecies made about Timothy. Well, what, is, what does that mean? I mean, the apostles said some things about what Timothy would be doing. The apostles affirm the calling of Timothy from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can promise you, he wasn't excited about everything he heard. And he wasn't really going, hey, I'm going to be a pastor. It's going to be cool. It's not cool to be a pastor. It's horrible. But it's the greatest thing I've ever accomplished in ministry. Because it's not something that we've done. It's something that Christ has done. And Christ sustains His true ministers. Christ sustains His true church. Christ sustains His people. And He's going to sustain, and He did sustain Timothy. And so Paul, as a loving spiritual father, tells Timothy... In accordance with these prophecies, remember what we said about you when we laid hands on you. Remember what we told you about this good deposit. Remember your teaching. Remember the gifts that you've been giving by God. I believe in leadership. I believe in development. I believe in honing skills. I believe we can always get better at doing anything that we do. We can get better at learning to read, right? We can get better at learning to take notes. We can get better at learning to think. We can, we can ward off a lot of distractions in life by being disciplined to certain things, having a routine in the morning, having a routine in the evening, just physically. I'm not talking about spiritual things. And we can get better. So, yes, there is a way in which we can learn to do certain things. But, beloved, when God gifts you with something, it doesn't matter how professional you are with it. And as a matter of fact, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says he doesn't care how professional people think that, 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 that he is or is not. And according to the testimony of Paul and others throughout the writing of the New Testament, we learn that Paul was a very poor orator. He was a terrible public speaker. He even says of his own teaching ability that he came sometimes with stuttering and words that were implausible and things of that nature and in tears and unable to speak and stand. That's how we know that the teaching of God's Word in, the, in conjunction with the overseeing of the joy of His people as a body is not about professionalism. The worship of God is not about bells, whistles, robes, and ornate or ornaments. It's about intimacy. 
in intimacy, whether it's, in pa it always has passion, whether it's you know, good or bad, whether it's anger or affection, whether it's zeal or apathy. It's intimacy. And sometimes that looks neat, and sometimes it's a mess, and sometimes it's very uh, effective and very encouraging, and sometimes it's harmful and it stings. But there's one true thing in the midst of all of that. The people of God who are listening to His Word and who are obeying their Savior and who love Him are going to hold fast according to the Scripture. This is not my opinion. This is not my illustration. This is not my logic. This is just clear, absolute, unirrefutable truth that the apostles say. I know I just made up a word. It's okay. Just write it in my dictionary. I've got one. Irrefutable. Yeah. <laughs> just, I should have just said that. Let's see how y'all mess me up. His word that if we deny the instruction of the apostles, we deny the instruction of Christ himself. It is not, it is not up for discussion. If we love him, we will do as he's told us to do. When things are good, easy. When things are not good, testing. Testing. So, Timothy, these prophecies made about you, by them you may wage the good warfare. What does that mean? Did he say, Timothy, all the giftedness you have and all the strength you have and all the power that you have and all the great tools that you have. Remember I talked about last week at the close of our service about the tools. Tools that Timothy had was the, are the Spirit of God or the teachings of Paul, the intimacy that he had with Paul, the instruction of Paul to him, the training that he developed. But here Paul is saying there's a third thing, and I don't know if I got into it last week because of time, but the prophecies, that which we know that God says you will do according to his purposes. And I read Isaiah 48 this morning, right? And Paul, excuse me, the prophet, God speaking to the prophet, what does he say there? The former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth and I announced them, and then suddenly I did them, and they came to pass. Why are we where we are today? Why is life the way it is? Because God has declared it and it has come to pass. That's why conspiracies are the devil's playpen. Assumption is his bread. And judgment is the icing on his cake. And then God says, because I know that you are obstinate and your neck is an iron sinew. I mean, the things that hold our joints in place, they need to be flexible. Iron doesn't bend easily. And you have the forehead of brass. I wish I had known that when I first got married. I wish I had known that text. Because instead of calling my children hard head, I'd call them brass heads. So what it is, is hard-headedness. I declared them to you from old, says the Lord, because they came to pass, I announced them to you so that you would not say, oh, look what we've accomplished. Look what my idols, look what my work has done. Look what my garved image and my metal images have brought forth. Now see, we don't worship things like that in this day, do we? But the graven images and the carved images are our study, our zeal, Our manipulation, how we're going to maneuver life, we're going to maneuver people, we're going to maneuver circumstances, we're going to maneuver facts. Look what we've accomplished. The world we live in, even in non-free nations, it's a world of politics. It's a world of idols made in the minds of men and women. But God speaks. And he's speaking today. Scripture is what God is saying and what God has said. God's word is not dying and sitting on a shelf. God's word is ever living and breathing, sharper than any two-edged sword. It does what it was sent to do. And today it is supposed to be sent to encourage us, beloved, to hold fast in the good warfare. 
to know that what God has prophesied about Timothy, God has prophesied about you. What is that? His will will be done. And you will make it. He will make it to the end of what he desires in every circumstance. That is why Paul can so passionately and almost crazily say, therefore do all things without grumbling and complaining. Endure all things without complaining. Every time we complain, we sin against God. Whether it's in our minds, our spirit, our countenance. But that sin does not reject His grace. Because Jesus uttered no complaints in His mouth. So He tells Timothy... Wage the good warfare by holding faith in a good conscience. Because some have not held the faith and do not have a good conscience, they're scared and fearful or knowledgeable and arrogant, boastful, know-it-alls, not willing to submit to the teaching of the Scripture. Even if a cat meows it out, we have to submit to what the cat says, not because the cat is the authority, but because the Word of God is. It doesn't matter if the devil himself speaks truly the word of God. The truth has authority over us. Because Christ is the truth. Well, what about the twist in the script? I'm not talking about it. I'm giving an example, folks. We know in the wilderness how the, how the devil twists the word. Because people have rejected this, Because they do not listen, because they do not hold a good conscience of peace, because they are not willing to submit to the teachings of the apostles, they have rejected and made a shipwreck of their faith. Now, does this mean that they're lost? No, not at all. Paul's not saying that Hymenaeus and Alexander are are unconverted. He's not saying that. Nowhere does he say that. Nowhere in the Bible do we see any false teachers or, or problems in the church where anybody is, is declared unconverted. They're declared wrong, called to correction, and celebrated and rejoiced, just like the one sinner coming to faith, celebrated and rejoiced when the brother is gained. Why? Because we love them. And we know that when they are living in obstinate sin and rejection of the teaching of the, of the apostles, that they are living in fear and darkness and bitterness, frustration, anger, self-interest, pity, gossip, all the different things that come along with, with these types of circumstances, and that there's nothing that can change that except that they stand and remember that they're forgiven in the blood and the body of Jesus Christ by His mercy and love for them, and that everybody else that they're upset with are in the same bag. So Paul has disciplined them out of the church so that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then Paul gives Timothy tools, practical application of what needs to be done. Here is this instruction. First of all, right? First of all. First thing I need you to do, Timothy. First thing I need you to do, James. First thing I need you to do, John. First thing I need you to do, whoever he wrote to. First thing I need you to do is pray. I need you to pray. I need you to pray. All right? How do I pray? What do I pray? For whom do I pray? He says, first of all, then I urge. Now, see, some people like to read the Bible this way. Oh, this is what we should do. We have to have supplications. We have to have prayers. We have to have intercessions. And we have to have thanksgivings. So we've got to figure out how to do these things. Now, I'm not poking fun at people who do that, but that's not how you read the Bible. That's how we end up with more pages in our systematic theologies than we should have. Nine pages on supplications. Listen to it. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. 
All right? And I'm going to have to address the elephant in the room in a couple of weeks, but I'm going to go ahead and start pumping the prime of the pump now when it comes to this text because this is a good pretext where people take not only that out of context and create four or five different ways and types of prayers and things, but then they all of a sudden start putting the emphasis on all people. And then we get to verse 4, and then we have this minutia and this cow plop of debate and argument about, oh, God does want to save all humanity and every single one without exception. And we know that's not true. Jesus refused to pray in John 17 for anyone but his sheep. Now, see, some people don't like the way that's phrased. Jesus says, I am not praying for these. By definition, that's a refusal. God, the Father, hasn't asked him to, but, you know, I am not going to eat these. That's not a refusal of a command. It's just, I'm not doing it. Did Jesus need to tell the Father what he was really doing? No, he said that, that it might be written down by the Spirit for our sake. Jesus prayed for the salvation of his elect people, for whom he was about to lay down his life. And then we can come to another way in which we can understand that, in a sense, we need to contemplate the reality of what is the mind of God in all things. Is the gospel not a command? Is every command of God not the responsibility of every human being? You see? So it depends on what side of the street you're on and from what angle, but we're not going to reject sovereign and free grace. We're not going to reject the gospel of Christ by how we handle the text. So we're going to deal with it in the context in which Paul is speaking. Who is Paul writing to? One man. And sometimes when we see the pastoral letters, this will be a pastoral letter. It's pastoral in its context. It's written to pastors, to a pastor. We forget that it's a person there. And we also forget, just like in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus, as a Pharisee and as the primary teacher of Israel and all these things, um, we forget that there is this, and we see it in the text of Scripture, when it comes to Israel and when it comes to certain people, it's very easy for us to just myopically embrace everything written to us. And when someone says do this, then it's just for us to do this. Or if the context of a particular instruction is given, we might just think, so if I say we are going to do this, all of us are going to do this. We are all going to do this. I'm speaking to you as a church and then to those who aren't in attendance today who are part of this church family. And then if it's something that we do constantly like the Lord's table every week, then I'm talking to those people who don't even know who we are and we don't know who they are that will be part of the family sometime in the near future. But I'm not talking to the guy driving the Jeep outside. Everybody looks. No, he just drove by. Or the police officer that just drove by. Or that dumpster fire. No, I'm just joking. I'm not saying we all and everybody within an eye shot. So there's the context. What is the context? Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's saying, here's how we handle this. Here's the first thing that you do after you command them to stop talking. So what does Paul say to do when there's people that are talking nonsense, changing things, talking to other people about these things? He says, all right, be quiet. Be quiet, be submissive to the instruction of Christ, and listen and be taught. And when that happens, guess what? That person is in right standing with the body and with the Lord. So command them to stop. And then what you need to do to fix everything that's going on in your church is you need to pray. So if Paul wrote a letter like that, then what would James Tippins, as the elder of Grace Truth Church, say in his head? Okay, I've got to pray for us. I've got to pray. I've got to get up at 217 like I did this morning. And just pray and pray and pray and pray. And just when your mind's on fire. I hate those days. I hate those nights. You just cannot stop the images and the thoughts and the, the words. So I'm just going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us. No. And Paul says, listen, we're not separated from the community in which we live. 
We're not separated from the state or the country. We're not separated from our neighbors. We're not, we're not a cult. We don't go buy land in the middle of nowhere and build a commune. That's what cults do. Now, if you want to go do that for yourself, that's fine, but you've got to come to the assembly. It's not biblical. Well, what about Israel? That's a picture of election. It's not a command to the New Testament church. Nowhere can you find that. Nowhere. Even to Jews today. You don't divorce yourself from the instruction of Scripture, and we don't divorce ourselves from the public, from being influential, from being caring, from being loving, and from being evangelists. You see. The cults do a good job of that. So Paul is saying, I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings. Be made, so this is something that is supposed to be done, right? For all people. Well, let's take them one at a time so we'll understand these words. A supplication is an earnest plea. Please, 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 can I have an ice cream? Children are the best at supplication. Please, if you love me. Is it too much to ask? Can I have a candy bar? Please. No. Please. No. Please. You know. Yeah. Supplication. Father, please hear me on behalf of these people. Hear me. Please. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord. Prayers. Just generally. Praying for, for needs, praying to the Lord. These are all ways in which we speak to the Lord. Supplication, I mean, intercessions, where we pray in the place of someone or for someone else. Not just for the church, not just for our spouse and children, not just for the members, but for all people. Pray for everybody. Now, I remember. Being in middle school, and I remember my prayers, and I remember sometimes going to bed at night and, and starting to pray, and then after a while, this is why I stay up a lot sometimes, because my mind has been disciplined to continue to pray, but you pray for everything. And then you say, oh, I didn't pray for the guy across, I didn't pray for the crazy guy down there talking to the stop sign, I didn't pray for his cat, and then you just, you know, that's what children do. i got to pray for everybody. Got to pray for the president, I got to pray for the vice president, got to pray for the secretary of state, got to pray for the, you know, and you go through the whole cabinet. Then you're going through all the judges, and you're praying for everything. Next thing you know, you go, oh, there's judges in Claxton. I've got to pray for all of them. I don't know their names. Let me go ask my dad. I mean, you know, you just, and it's just, you've got to pray for everybody. Oh, I forgot to pray for great aunt Sally and great aunt Lucy and great great aunt's dog. And, and then you just, next thing you know, the sun's coming up. That's crazy, right? But that's how we take it sometimes. You've got to pray for everybody. Or we do the beauty pageant prayers to pray for everyone in the entire world, Lord. All humans, each and every one specifically, I pray for right now. You know? The Lord hasn't told us to do that. And he's not telling us to do that there. So when the apostle gives the pastor instruction to be praying, supplicate, pray, intercede, and be thankful, what is, in, what is thanksgiving? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. To him. The king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a praise of thanksgiving. This is gratitude. So we don't just ask for and pray for and intercede for and plead with and talk to God. We thank him. And I don't dare quote people from history, but there's a sentiment in which a famous Baptist pastor would say that God can do more in five seconds or five minutes or a few minutes, I don't know the exact quote, of prayer than we can in our entire lifetime. And beloved, we don't pray enough. And see, our culture has taught us, have some prayer meetings. Seventy people, seventy hours. You know, perfect, right? And everybody gets to talk to God openly about everything on their heart and mind in front of everybody else. And you know what it happens? Or let's have prayer requests. Yeah, pray for my mom and a couple of friends and some unspokens. Thank you. Well, what's going on? None you. None your business. That's what's going on. 
When do we need to know the business if it's a practical need that we can meet? Well, they're starving to death. Oh, well, I got food. You know. Well, you know. <laughs> Lord bless them. That's always a gossip. I've never heard an old lady say that where something bad didn't come out of the mouth concerning the person they were about to pray for. And then the damage is done, and then they show up to the auxiliary meeting or to the prayer meeting or to the Sunday school class the next week, and they'll go, oh, there's Daddy. <laughs> hey. You know. <laughs> How you doing? Lord bless her. You know what she's going through? You need to pray. <laughs> she slapped her neighbor with a chicken. And they got to a fist fight right out in the front of the front of the house. I mean, you hear it. You hear it constantly. And this is coming out of the top of my head, and y'all are interested in the story, right? Like, can you please tell us the rest so we can pray? <laughs> That's the way it is. If God ever disqualifies me, I'll go into comedy. All people, pray for them. What does it mean? Not just the church. Not just your household but all kinds of people that are around you. Unbelievers, first, pray. What's the context here? Pray for guys like Hamanaeus and Alexander. God, get them, destroy them, save them. That's not praying. That's not why we're supposed to pray. Father, thank you for these men. Thanksgiving. I thank you for their... <laughs> false teaching and the knuckleheadedness that they've had and their, their brass-headedness for their iron sinews. I thank you for this stubbornness, for in it you will show your power great. Please bring them back to us. Bring them to repentance that we may rejoice together and take your table together and worship together and serve together. For these are our brothers for whom Christ said, It is finished Take them into your arms, Father, and bring them back to the gospel in a way that they've never seen before. Empower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, whatever, however you speak. I talk like that sometimes when I'm giving instruction on taking out trash. Get the bags and the thing and roll it, roll it, roll it, you know. Dad, quit yelling at me. I'm just excited about the trash. Get it out of here. Intercessions, praying for them, pleading with God that these people who had been turned over to Satan would learn not to blaspheme. These people who have turned over to Satan would learn not to gossip. These people who have turned over to Satan would learn not to commit adultery. These people who have turned over to Satan would learn not to steal. These people we've turned over to Satan would learn not to abandon God's promises. And to destroy God's people. And so he gives an explanation. What does he mean? All people. Well, let's plug in an extremely long grammar lesson by just saying for all kinds of people. Not just these people. Not just the church. I want you to pray for kings. I mean, when's the last time you sat down and said, Father, I just want to thank you for Joe Biden. I want to thank you for Donald Trump. I want to thank you for Barack Obama. When he won the first time, I posted on Facebook, thank you, Father, for the president that you've given us. And I lost 200 friends online that day by being obedient to Scripture. Now, I don't do that stuff anymore because I realize this is really not beneficial. I can pray without posting. But I thought the church would, you know, they can join in with me. <laughs> the saints. Pray for the kings. Pray for all who are in high positions. Why? Because they lead us. They govern us. They rule us. They oversee us. They do what God has ordained them to do. And what are we supposed to be praying? That we, the people of God, 
may lead a peaceful life, a quiet life, a godly life, and a dignified life. Keeping it real is undignified and ungodly. Saying what you need to say because it's something that needs to be said is undignified and ungodly. Social media use, most always ungodly. <laughs> but this sermon is not about cleaning up our lives, is it? It's about understanding the order of the Christian faith in living life together as a people. Pray that we may lead a peaceful and quiet and godly and dignified in every way. This is good and this is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. I'll stop right there. So here, Paul... Saying, young Timothy, as an elder, I need you to learn to teach the church. First, you pray, and then teach the church to pray. And don't just pray for yourselves. Pray for all types of people. Pray for the people in your immediate context. Pray for the people, all people. Saved people, lost people, ugly people, good-looking people, rich people, poor people. Look at James. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that... What was happening with James, with the Jewish Christians, is that they, were, they had gone back to the day when in Judaism where you gave favoritism to the one who was most pious or most wealthy or most prosperous. Why? Because it was an indication that they were most blessed. And James says, give the seat of honor to the lowest, nasty, unbathed critter that comes to the door. Put the governor at the back of the room. For the love of Pete. He's got it made. This man hadn't sat down all week on a, on a chair. Let him sit at the front. Don't show favoritism. So you've got to be patient with all. Timothy, he's going to talk about that. Endure all evil with all patience with all people. A pastor that does that and does this is disqualified. A pastor that posts any name of any one of his brothers and sisters on the internet is disqualified. A pastor that gets into a spitting contest on his front porch is disqualified and such is the same via text message or phone call or anything else. If you know what that means, that's just hillbilly for an argument, a heated argument. <laughs> and verse 3 is not talking about the gospel. Paul didn't say, I want you to pray for all types of people, for the people in control, for the people in kings and people in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful life with them. We need to be peaceable with them. We need to do everything we can do to stay on task as a people who are called by the glory of God for the sake of His name, to do everything we can to stay out of the light of people who rule and don't do anything that would cause them to pay attention to you in any negative sense. Do what you're called to do quietly and with dignity. Yeah, for those of you who use Reddit, I mean, you see the subreddits of the Karens and the Chads, the people of Walmart that keeps it real. And all the other snaps up and in your face things and we go yes that feels good to me why because we want to be vindicated we want vengeance we want to be in control America is the only country in the world where every single citizen is a god and a king simultaneously unto themselves according to the Constitution and we take it to heart Marats though what right do we have in the economy of grace except to be instruments of mercy. Grace upon grace upon grace. So stay out of the... Does that mean we don't say? We don't go to a board meeting? We don't go? Yes, but we need to be hospitable. We need to be dignified. We can present argument without anger. We can present illustrations without ad hominem. It's wicked. It's just as wicked as the wickedness of the world. And beloved, when we do these things, our prayers are hindered. So this is a passionate plea for Timothy to hold fast, to know that not only if we aren't living according to the gospel, God's not going to hear our prayers according to the gospel. Why? Because we're not going to pray effectively. 
God always hears a prayer that's in His will, right? We talked about it yesterday in our men's group. Sometimes we pray for that which is not the will of God because we're not walking in the Spirit. We're not walking in light. We're not walking according to the will of God. Of course I'm not going to pray for what God desires me to pray for if I'm walking selfishly. If I'm all uptight, anxious, angry, frustrated, wanting revenge, wanting to tear something apart, wanting to you know, overthrow the government. You're not going to do it. I mean, we got soldiers in the room. <laughs> Billy Bob and James Tippins ain't going to overthrow nothing. Pew, pew. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And it's not the place of the believer to worry about this stuff. God has ordained it all. This isn't a Romans 13 sermon. <laughs> but this is what he's saying. This is good. What is good? Living a dignified life. Is a dignified life required for salvation? Absolutely not. If it was, we're doomed. But yet it was in the context of God's righteousness. So whose life dignified do we get credit for? Jesus Christ. Well, are we praying correctly? Are we supplicating, praying, interceding, and thanking God as we should? Absolutely not. Even when we do it all day, every day, it's not going to be pure. It's not going to be right. It's not going to be sufficient. Well, by, and by, by, by Lord, my Lord, how in the world am I going to stand in front of you righteous if this is a requirement here? Who in the world has ever done this correctly? Jesus, I pray that you would pass this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And if we need to spend 60 weeks to figure out what that means, we need to just back up and go, wow, what did he say? Jesus prayed for his accusers. Well, what he really meant, God hasn't revealed what he really meant. And for us to go there is to make ourselves God, saying that we know what God really meant. How about we just take what God has said at face value and go with it? God is not subject to our logic. God is not subject to our rules, nor our fairness, nor our laws. He is a law unto himself because he is the righteous one. This is good. What? Living a, God, living a godly, dignified, peaceful, quiet life. Christians should not be known for what they hate. Gospel preachers and gospel evangelists should not have the moniker of all the false stuff going on in the world. That's not a gospel preacher. And it surely isn't a shepherd of God's people. And a good brother and a sister in the faith is not one who can dig deep and tell you everything that's wrong and all the different divisions of all the different theological philosophies that are known to man. And you can tell they're not walking in the spirit because they get irate when you try to talk to them. And they scream and they yell and they accuse and they point. And beloved, history is full of it. Look at, the, look at the, the, the pastors and the bishops of antiquity. Look at all the letters and the writings and the things back in two. And there's really no difference between them and what we are now, but everybody has a way to write now. Everybody couldn't even write back in those days. And it's just argument after argument after argument after argument. And if you really want to get offended, just go read Luther. He'll offend your conscience. Because if I spoke like Luther on Facebook and they came in this pulpit, y'all would have a problem with me. I mean, that man even called somebody a devil's fart one time in public. Now, when I was a boy, the word fart and the word crap were dirty words. You had to be almost 14 for you to say those. Much less a pastor. This is good. Beloved, do we want to do what is good and pleasing in the sight of our Lord, our Savior? You see how this is it's emphatic that Paul is saying, listen, if we just pray, and we pray first and foremost that we can get along with the world around us. Now, there's going to come a time when the world around us is not going to tolerate peace. There's going to come a time when the world around us is not going to tolerate godly lives. That's not happening right now. There's nowhere in the history of America right now where any institution or any government authority is intolerable to godly lives and peace and quiet. The factions that we see are self-made. I'm standing up against this. I'm standing up against that. Well, let's find that. 
Well, Ephesians. Ephesians, pastor. Do not partake in the works of iniquity, but expose them. Who's he talking to? The church. So you see me walking like a devil saying, James, look at yourself. I love you, brother. Stop. <laughs> You're right. This is wicked. I'm so sorry, man. Pray for me. Yes. Don't make judgment. We don't have that authority. See, there's a context for all of it. And it doesn't reject the other teachings. So when we find something that seems to be in the opposite vein of something else, we don't get to wiggle the word into working it out how we want it to sound. We have to just take it at face value. So if Paul is saying we must live a godly life so that we might live a godly and quiet life with other people around us, and we must also be praying for them, we're not just praying for our mutual intimacy in the world, but we're, I mean, in the body, but we're praying for some type of intimacy and calmness and peace in the world. And it is why the cults sometimes have a better standing in the culture than the church, but yet have no gospel, so there's no power there. Because sometimes the cults can serve and stay quiet. But what do you call them? Compromisers, weeps, sissies. Not a sissy. Jesus was not a sissy. And he is the pinnacle and the ultimate man. He's the ultimate masculine. And we like his table kicking. And we like his dog and whitewashed tomb name calling. The people he was talking to do not exist in the world today. So we can't emulate that at all. As a matter of fact, he tells us not to. We need to listen to the word. And beloved, just think about it for a second. Letting go of all stressful animosity and frustration that boils in us from every corner of everything that we have in existence. Letting that go is peace in and of itself. Because here's the thing. What we think is so important today, when crisis hits our household, like it has hit mine the last year, and more specifically the last two months, <laughs> that stuff doesn't matter at all. And if it were important, I couldn't put it aside, could I? If the house was flooding and we were all about to drown, and then someone catches on fire, we got two problems that can't be ignored. You see? I don't know where this comes from, y'all. I'm sorry. Sleeplessness. But when the drippy water hose on the back side of the farm has been dripping since 1961, and that's all we think about, and then the house catches fire, we don't care. And the world and everything in it and every person that bothers us and everything that ever comes against us is like an old faucet dripping from 1961 on the back of the farm that we never see. Let it drip. God holds the tap anyway. So let's read this again and let me... Read, let me put some words in there. And over the next few weeks, we're going to have about three parts to this little section here. Three, maybe four. To expand upon it as necessary, I believe. An orderly life starts with prayer. And prayer is for all kinds of people, not just church people. And not just peers, but people that are higher than us and people that are lower than us. In stature or economics or public opinion. What was Jesus' public reputation? A poor one. Those who were and who made things happen, they talked ill of Jesus all the time because he ministered to sinners, to dirty people, to lowly people. And sometimes that we fear what people think of us, even in the context of our circles or our theology, more than we do what's called of, of us in our godly daily lives. 
And so pray for all types of people. First of all, then I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all kind of people. For kings who are in high positions, and kings and for all who are in high positions. These types of people too, you see? Not just us, them. That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good that we pray for them. This is good that we live this way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. See the, see the contrast here? We don't just pray for ourselves. We'll pray for all kinds of people. don't want to pray for just people that like us. We'll pray for people in high places, rich people and powerful people too. And then we have a Savior, God, our Savior, the church. We have a tendency, especially in, 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 in sovereign grace communities, to really be myopic, to really be exclusive and judgmental. That's not, that's not okay. We shouldn't be seeking out to find the devil in everybody. Because we will. But we should be seeking to serve everyone. God, our Savior, and not just ours alone. Remember how John put it? But the propitiation for the world. Now we know the context in which John speaks in 1 John. He's not saying every particular person without exception. He's not saying every human being ever. Because if Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God for every human being ever, then every human being ever are elect and every human being ever will have faith in Jesus Christ. And we know just by the laws of experience that that's not the case. So the context rules. Context beats grammar, beloved. Because sometimes... Dummies make up words that contradict itself, like me. So this is good and it is pleasing the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all kinds of people to be saved, all types of people to be saved, all ranks of people, all races of people, all, this is really weird to say these days, all genders of people. <laughs> See, that shouldn't be triggered. So what? Men and women, rich and poor, boys and girls, all types of sinners, drunks, murderers, thieves, blasphemers, gossips, disobedient to parents, haughtiness, people who roll their eyes, people who, their tongues, all types of sinners. And I'm just, those are lists that Paul's, Paul's given, haughtiness. You know, sassiness. God's going to save his elect out of all of them. God desires his elect to be saved and is going to bring them to faith and to truth. And there are elect in every nation and every tongue and every tribe and every iteration of every wickedness and every sin and everything that you could ever imagine. Every single, there's not one cult that doesn't have an elect person in it. There's not one theological iteration that God's not going to pull somebody out. So believe it or not, beloved, all Southern Baptists aren't reprobate, all Methodists aren't reprobate, all Calvinists aren't reprobate, all Arminians aren't reprobate. But God has elect. And I know, don't swallow your tongues. God has elect in all people. And so if God is in the business of reconciling his elect people from all places and points and parts of life, then he's in the business of reconciling those who surely he has already born again to himself and to his people. Because you realize that that's what reconciliation does, right? The gospel brings us to God. And then the gospel instruction brings us to one another. The only way we love Christ is to serve one another. The only way we worship Christ is to give our life to others. And we don't get to pick and choose. Well, I'm going to serve that one. I'm going to love that one. I'm going to pray for that one. I'm going to be nice to that one, but not that one. Why? Let's look at them. No. We don't get to do that. We don't get to be patient with only who we want to be patient with. People want you to be patient with them, but they don't want you to be patient with others. Beloved, we got a problem, and it's called our sin nature. 
And it's been put to death because Christ has died and we are alive in him. But this old ragged body, oh, who's going to save me from this body of death, Paul says. He says, it is God in Christ. And then Paul begins to explain in verse 5, and I'll, I'm not going to preach all this today. For there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man. See this reconciliation? There's one mediator between God and Hymenaeus and Alexander. There's one mediator between all these people who have gone astray in this false teaching. There's one mediator from everybody who's abandoning the body of Christ. There's one mediator between God and man. The man Jesus Christ. And he gave himself as a ransom for all. For every person without exception? No, we know that that's not what it's saying. For his people, amongst all peoples. Jesus did not die for Jews alone. He died for his elect Jews. He died for his elect Americans. He died for his elect purple, green, yellow, brown, white, orange people. Remember that song we used to sing, red and yellow, black and white? I don't even know if that's legit anymore, is it? Probably not. And this is the testimony given at the proper time. What Paul is saying is is that what he just said and what I just extrapolated is the testimony of Christ. At the proper time was preached, given, God gave it and sent it. For this, for this gospel, I was appointed a preacher and an overseeing messenger of the people of God. And I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So here is Timothy, raised in a Jewish home, a Gentile himself. So now the picture comes to full focus, doesn't it? God is going to save his people for whom Christ died out of the world, out of all peoples. And if he has done that and satisfied the wrath of God for his people, then we are to be satisfied with reconciliation amongst ourselves. So let's pray. Let's pray and let's thank God for what he's done in Christ Jesus who was our ransom. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have called us to pray. And the very next thing that Paul writes to Timothy is, I desire that in every place the men would pray. The people would pray. The brothers and the sisters would pray. The children would pray. So, Father, we're together praying this morning. And Father, we pray for ourselves. Each of us individually, we pray the things that we deal with, the sin that entangles us, the the, the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the behaviors that come from those things, Lord. We're always at odds. We're always at war. But we are not at war even with ourselves or with one another or with the world. We are at war with the principalities and the powers of darkness that you and your sovereignty have decreed and are fulfilling your ultimate purpose. And one day we will be free of it all. But until that day, Lord, help us to wage the good warfare. Help us to see and to understand the word more and more each day. Lord, help us to reach out to our brothers and sisters who have not been with us in a while. Lord, help us to reconcile, as long as it's up to us, those who have gone astray. And if they do not reciprocate, Father, it is not on us. But Lord, most of all, help us to stand firm in the gospel, knowing that your Son, Jesus, alone has satisfied your justice and that you have declared us righteous because of him and that you have credited us his righteousness and that not only have you decreed it and shown it and done it, you have brought it to pass. And Father, that which you have all promised now, we await that day of glory. It will come to pass. So help us to be at peace until that day. And help us to look into the gospel, into the cross, into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our sufficient assurance and hope as we traverse this great life. In Jesus' name, amen.